Eminem had decided that he wanted to be a rapper, but uh, as a white rapper, I mean, he really had no role model. There was really nobody else out there. Marshall began making tapes in the basement of his mother's house with Deshaun Halton, a Lincoln High School classmate who called himself Proof. Um, he did not meet Proof until he was around probably 18, 17 or 18. Proof was very, very respectful, very polite in his manners. Do you need me to do anything for you? Or he would say please and thank you, where the other kids were just like, get me this or do that, or no, I'm not taking out the garbage. They were using the basement all the time to practice and scratch records, but I found out they were my album <laughs> that they used to scratch. Marshall and Proof would come out of the basement with a tape they persistently shot to local record stores, including Record Time, run by Harry Bunner. Eminem and his crew that he hung out with, they were the basement production crew all his cats that he used to hang out with. And they'd come in and they'd buy all the new hip hop that come out. It didn't matter who it was. If it was something new and cool, especially out of New York, they bought it. So all this stuff's coming in and they're buying all this stuff and everything, but anytime anybody locally come out, they hated him. Especially Marshall. Marshall's like, these guys suck. These guys don't have no talent. ICP, who are they? They suck. And then he started getting down on Kid Rock and stuff, and I happened to have a shirt on that day, and he's like, you like Kid Rock and everything? I'm like, yeah, I like Kid Rock. I support local hip-hop. And he's like, well, he sucks. I go, you're telling me all these bands that suck, but I haven't heard a damn thing come out of your mouth yet. He didn't really make a name for himself until uh, there was a Kid Rock in the store that we had. He had just released his album on Jive Records, and um, he just started getting a buzz. So there's all these kids are coming in for Kid Rock stuff. And all of a sudden, here comes this little, skinny little kid with blue eyes. I'll challenge you to a rap right now. Yo, you want a battle? Yo, yo, yo. Kind of in Kid Rock's face. And everybody's like, well, who is this asshole? And oh, it's just that uh, Marshall, there's an Eminem guy that he calls himself. He's just over there rapping. He thinks he's going somewhere. And all the, uh, you know, every other word is after this, after that. And everybody was looking around like, who is this kid? <laughs> you know, he come, he's coming in the store and bugging Kid Rock. You know, you want to battle? He's like, Kid Rock don't battle. You know, Kid Rock's like, you know, got his own thing going on. He was really cool about it. And he said, listen, he goes, today is my day. Your day may come. He goes, but this is my in store right now. Um, I've heard some of your stuff. And you go way too fast. You need to enunciate. When you enunciate, people understand you then maybe you can have an in-store like me. So then he became Eminem, and that was really when he began to market himself. With M, you know, he learned the art of business, he learned the art of networking, as well as working on his craft and getting better and better. And, 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 and in doing that, he was able to meet people and get people to listen to him that maybe were outside of his normal circle of Detroit, which helped him get discovered. Eminem began to hone his craft in earnest, attending open mics and freestyle showcases around Detroit. However, the greatest test of his young life would soon arrive. Kim got pregnant. He came in and he was like, wow, man, I just found out that Kim's pregnant and I'm going to be a dad, you know, and how am I going to get a house? I got this job, barely pays enough. Haley Jade Scott was born Christmas Day, December 25th, 1995. I know after he was born and everything just seemed like it went uh, hot and high water. The baby was used as a weapon, you know, against Marshall. But instead of following the actions of his father and grandfather, Haley's birth brought a new sense of focus and determination to Eminem. He was going to succeed where his family had failed. Marshall loved his daughter. He stepped up the plate. And, I mean, he did take care of his daughter. Eminem viewed fatherhood as a blessing. He threw himself into providing for his family while polishing his rap skills. Gilbert's Lodge is a down-home roadhouse outside of St. Clair Shores. Marshall worked at Gilbert's on and off for three years. Gilbert's Lodge was 
probably Eminem's mainstay for a while. I mean, that was his steady gig. When, uh, when the tapes weren't selling, when people weren't coming to his gigs, um, he could always count on going back to Gilbert's Lodge and flipping burgers. And from what I'm told, he was a pretty good short order cook. He would quit there, go to a, a new job for like two weeks, and then go back to Gilbert's, and then quit again, do another job, and then go back to Gilbert's. Working double shifts for minimum wage, Gilbert's became more home than home. When Marshall first started working at Gilbert's, he used to wear those really baggy, baggy pants. And I'm looking at him going, man, pull those pants up, buddy. How can you work and not trip over them? Whenever he worked, just constantly rapping, rapping, holding his skills. When he would get a food order, for example, he'd start a rhyme based on what the food order was. You know, he would bring in tapes for people and say, listen to this, what do you think about this? He'd try and get people to come out to his performances. And a lot of the people did go. I mean, they didn't like rap. They might be at a rough club somewhere in Detroit. They wouldn't have gone to otherwise, but they liked him, and so they would go to show the support. Very, very steely focus. That's one thing I noticed about him. You know, he was uh, very intense. You could see it in his eyes. Everything would just come off the tops of their heads, and I'd just sit there in amazement. But yet, I'd be going, okay, where's my cheese balls? Let's go. Okay, <laughs> I got people waiting for their food, and they're just going on and on and on, you know. And it, it, they did wonderful. It was, it was quite entertaining. When he wasn't working at Gilbert's Lodge, he was working on his career. Marshall would usually write either on a little notebook, on the back of a ticket. Whatever he could write on, he would write on. If it was his hand, or he'd always be writing something down. He would go into the zone, man. It's, I can't even explain it. And when he would go in the zone, he would be completely sober, man. He would put his little headphones on, and he would take his finger like this. And he would actually write the rhymes in his head and write them out in the air. And he would have like, most people would have like one notepad, but he would have like five, six different pieces of paper. It's almost like he sees the world uh, in a hall of mirrors. And he takes those distorted images and he puts them in his music. There was no school of hip hop where you could walk in and they, you know, you got to do it like this. He would take a whole page front and back with just small writing. I mean, you'd have to get a magnifying glass to actually see what he was writing because he'd write so small. He would write all these words in like three columns and it would go down. All these words would rhyme. And all the words that didn't completely rhyme with them, but he could make them rhyme, he would write them in the next column. And he would go in and pick each one of these words and like match them up. It's like decoding it. He'd sit down at the table with a track that he liked. He'd play it through and rewind. Bzzz, rewind again. Keep writing, keep writing. He'll go in the booth and he'll sit there and he'll write and he'll listen to it. And he'll have the sounds just blaring. And it's pretty much like the same sample over and over and over until he get it completely written. He's going around to the hip-hop shops, all these other places. He's getting into these battles downtown. I, I walk out of the ste off the steps of St. Andrews, and it's an alleyway in between St. Andrews and this other club, and there was a big circle out there. I'm like, oh, man, they're about to fight. And then I'm like, I'll get closer to the circle. I'm like, no, nah, oh, they got a battle going on, you know? To establish his reputation as a rapper, Eminem began participating in rap battles at various Detroit hip-hop clubs. St. Andrew's Hall is a converted church and a popular hip-hop club in downtown Detroit. The basement is called The Shelter, one of the most important proving grounds in the city. Being in The Shelter is like being in the basement of your mom's house and you having a big block party. Everybody that comes in knows everybody. Music is pumping and the MCs are up there rapping and everybody is attentive to what they're saying, hanging on every word that they said. Eminem would now have to bear out his talents in front of all black audiences. Like the song Lose Yourself from the 8 Mile soundtrack, the stage at St. Andrews gave Eminem his first shot. Even when M would go up there and you always have the people who just like didn't get into him, you still had the other people that really got into him. He really had no role model. There was really nobody else out there. And in Detroit at the time, there was a place called the Hip Hop Shop. Saturdays at the Hip Hop Shop, I think they started around 12 noon. Uh, and um, proof would usually host and DJ Head would usually spin the records. Um, I mean it was pretty much based on the audience ruling who who got 
burn the hardest and who was most triumphant. The rap battles were, they were deep, you know, you might dig into somebody's personal life, but you know, it was whoever could put their lyrics together the best. You know, and week after week, you could tell when somebody went home and they were practicing and they lived and breathed it. That's the thing about, you know, going to the rap battles. The guys that were rapping weren't just some guys who decided yesterday that they want to rap and they decided they were going to write some stuff. No, these guys lived and breathed hip-hop. But Eminem's early battles were hard fought and never easily won. he just come out, start rhyming, and was done and leave the stage. And people were like, yeah, he's really good. He was putting like 110% in of everything, with any rap battle, any, anywhere he could be noticed. He was dedicated. He was trying to make it. He was trying to explain to Kim, look, you know, this could be our big break. Let me do it. She was always had a, a word in about him doing that. Why are you doing this? You need to go out and buy your, dad, you know, your daughter diapers. Teaming up with Proof and local Detroit producers, Jeff and Mark Bass, Eminem made his first record and two-song EP called Backstabber. Backstabber, which was inspired by this fight that he had with Kim, his girlfriend at the time. I think that was the first time he really let rip with his emotions on uh, recording. He took his uh, tax money and pressed it up. He pressed like uh, 500 to 1,000 copies. The song did okay. I mean, it didn't do massive amounts of numbers. I think he sold like... 200 of them. Mark Kempf was Eminem's first manager. Mark founded Underground Sounds magazine, a national hip-hop publication based in Detroit. Unlike other hip-hop magazines at the time, Underground Sound paid attention to up-and-coming artists, especially if they were from the same hometown of Detroit. My original meeting with Eminem was a phone conversation. He called asked me how does he submit his tape, he's, he likes the magazine, he's interested in getting some type of coverage in the magazine. He sent in the tape, I liked it, I reviewed it. You could hear that there was some talent here. You could just hear it, that something's got to happen here. It's just too good not to happen. Nothing happened. He said a lot of people took him as a joke, and he went through a lot of reverse racism, and Proof kind of gave him pretty much the ghetto pass. When he first put the tapes out, you know, people were like, eh, you know, not really feeling it. You didn't even finish school, now you want to rap, you're going to be a white rapper, it's not going to work. You know, everybody from his school, from, you know, guys in the neighborhood, the nightclubs, people laughed at him. When he was in the suburbs, the white kids didn't want to listen to this kid singing black music. And when he was in the city, the black kids didn't want to hear this white kid playing black music and trying to perform black music. Somebody at the end of the show passing something out and a guy took it, said this is a joke, throws it out and there's just like some altercation. All I saw was this massive amount of people into this little swarm and he's in the middle of it. They settled everything, tempers, you know, settled down and stuff. And that's when I knew that there was something else behind this guy, that he was very serious about what he wanted to do and he took offense with what people said to him. Here he did all this work and put all this stuff out and people were throwing the trash and weren't even giving it a listen. Even through a stormy relationship with Kim, the continual struggles of raising a daughter and the grind of working a minimum wage job, Eminem relentlessly pursued his music career. Working once again with Jeff and Marky e. Baz, the producers who had been mentoring him since he was 15, Eminem was able to complete and release his second recording, Infinite. Infinite comes out. I thought it was a really good album all the way through. It was out on cassette. It was out on vinyl. I remember hearing it, listening to it, thinking, God, this guy's really good. I walked into this club to see some groups. I wanted to see Proof's group, Five Ella. I wasn't expecting Eminem. Proof was like, you heard the new Eminem stuff. I was like, no, but this um, a dude over there just brought me his new, new album. I was like, I want to meet Eminem. Where's Eminem at? He was like, that dude. I was like, wait a minute, the white dude that just brought this up to me, that's Eminem? I was floored because I got that tape and a couple others and that was all I listened to. Wondered why he was still rapping in tiny clubs to 10 people. For local artists, getting on the air of hip-hop radio station WJLB is a gateway to success in Detroit and beyond.